Good morning, everyone. My name is Barbara Harrison, and I'm an Extension Master Gardener here in Buncombe County, and I will be your host today. Welcome to Gardening in the Mountains, Cool Cover Crops. I'd like to welcome our speaker this morning, John Bowen. Our master gardener, John Bowen, has been gardening in different places across America for years and years. He's seen his share of new and empty garden spaces, of wet gardens and dry gardens, of red clay, black clay, and sand. He's been using cover crops for years to open new beds, reclaim soil, and feed his honeybees. He's learned that effective cover cropping isn't as simple as it seems that there is planning and choices and decisions to be made. So he wants to share some of those choices with us today, choices for some pretty cool cover crops. So let's go, take it away, John. Well, thank you very much, Barbara. Who here is looking for something to plant in their garden? Something incredibly beautiful, something that will kill all your weeds, provide your fertilizer, make your soil black and crumbly, pick your tomatoes, and do all your watering. A little extreme, right? Maybe too good to be true. But if you've been reading the garden articles out of the popular press that are appearing all the time now, those are some of the claims you've probably seen for cover crops. Today we're going to talk about that because you're going to find that it's not necessarily so. There are some decisions you probably want to make and some complications along the way. We're going to explore that. The first good question we might want to ask here is, what are we going to cover today? We're going to look at the benefits and the drawbacks of cover crops, some of the tips and the tricks that we as master gardeners and farmers have learned over the years. Talk about three examples of my favorite cover crops and then give you some resources to help you dig into this a little bit more and make good cover crop decisions. Cover cropping, it's a huge world of information. Asking somebody to talk to you about cover crops is like asking somebody to talk to you about gardening. It just goes everywhere. So we're not going to do a catalog of cover crops today. We're going to try to focus on some good examples and see what we can learn about this. We're going to be stopping along the way for questions. So as you think of things as we go through, put them in the chat box and Barb will take a look at them and we'll try to answer some of these as we go. Before we get too far along, I need you to know that this is me a couple of years ago. I have been cover cropping for quite a while, as you can tell. This is me planting my very first cover crop a couple of years ago. And guess what? This is me coming in from planting a cover crop last week. And if you look carefully, you can see not much has changed. That's what gardening does for you. I also want to acknowledge before we go on, our master gardener, Diana Simpson. She's my co-conspirator in this. She's done some of the research, she's provided some references, she's provided some of the photos, and she's made this presentation a lot simpler. So thank you very much, Diane. But what is a cover crop? What are we actually talking about here? Well, there are three things about cover crops. Firstly, they provide some benefit <laughs> to the garden. You're planting them to help the garden, not to help the gardener. You're not planning to harvest them and eat them or make bouquets or something. They're to benefit the soil, they're to make your garden better. They're generally not your main crop plant. They're a plant that you're planting when your main crop plant is not in there, when you have an empty bed, when you're in a fallow mode over the winter. They use available space, but they're not why you're growing the garden. And thirdly, you probably have heard the term green manure applied to cover crops. What's a manure? Well, it's something that you add to the garden to provide some nutrients. And to the extent that some cover crops can provide some nutrients, they can act like a manure, they can be a green manure. All cover crops aren't green manures, and I probably won't use that term throughout this talk, but it's one you do here, and to a certain extent, it's synonymous with the idea of cover crops, but I think you'll see by the end where the differences are. Let's look at an example of how this is useful. July 4th, 4th of July, this is my garden. I harvested my onions. I raked the mulch off the end of this bed. And what you see there is pretty much bare garden soil with my soaker hose snaking back and forth across it. Off in the back, off to the right-hand side, you can also see some tomatoes staked in there. And that strawy looking stuff is actually rye straw from last spring's cover crop. The point of showing you this bed though is that we're gonna set up a scenario here. I am not 
planning to replant this bed until next spring. Not sure what's going in there right now, but it's going to be bare until next spring. So what can I do with that bare spot? Well, one possibility is simply to leave it bare, like you see in this picture of somebody else's garden bed. Bare soil. What's going to happen if I do that till spring? First thing I'm going to see is that rain is going to fall and rain is going to compact that soil. Rain is heavy and the bam, 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 bam of raindrops all winter long can do a lot to squeeze that soil down, to compact it, to make it dense. I've been trying to overcome that. So that doesn't sound too good to me. What else might happen? Well, as that rain falls down, it's going to take the nutrients that are up in my topsoil in the top three or four inches of my soil, it's gonna leach them down into the subsoil. It's actually gonna wash them down. And to a certain extent, it's gonna wash them off to the sides if it's a heavy rain. They may run out into the lawn on the garden shown here or down the sewer into the lakes and streams, but we're gonna lose those nutrients because of the rain. Another thing that's gonna happen is that weeds are gonna grow. They're gonna start now and they're gonna grow over winter. A lot of our weeds are great for winter growth. And I may end up with a weedy patch in the spring when I'm ready to plant. But now for the rest of the summer here in the early fall, also that soil is gonna get hot. Sun's gonna beat down on that dark soil. It's gonna get hotter and hotter. Hot soil tends to speed up the oxidation, the destruction of the soil organic matter. But we all work hard to raise that organic matter level in the soil. And we don't want it to oxidize away any faster than necessary. Earthworms don't like hot soil. The microbes don't like hot soil. It's just not a good thing. And the last thing that's going to happen here is that that soil is going to be very wet in the spring. The rain is going to build up in there. It's going to be totally water saturated if we have a normal year. And if I want to get in there and do things to that soil, if I want to work in there in any way in the spring, that soil can be really wet. On our clays that most of us have around here, we can turn our garden soil into little clay balls. I know this is true because I have created little clay balls. So wet soil in the spring is not always a good thing. But there are some other things that will happen too. One advantage for me is that right now in the summer, I'm pooped out. It is no work to leave that bed bare. Nothing to do, just sit back, have a long drink of water, and watch that happen in my garden with no work from me. The other thing that will happen is that my spring planting, tomatoes or beans, whatever goes in there, is gonna be pretty easy. I'm gonna to have to break up the crust and may have to work the soil up a little bit because it's gonna be compacted. I'm gonna to have to get the weeds off, rake them off, hoe them out. But overall, it's not going to be a complicated task. It's one that I've done year after year. There's also going to be lots of moisture in the spring, and that's great if I am planting and I can work the soil. There's plenty of water there to support that early spring growth. I won't have to start watering as soon because that soil will be at field saturation. So what's the conclusion? What do I think about leaving just bare soil? I would say, all in all, bare soil doesn't sound too great. There's some definite downsides and a little bit less work is not enough to overcome it. So what are some of the other options? What else might I do besides leave it there? Well, a second choice option is to apply a layer of mulch like we see in this garden bed. I can put on compost, I can put shredded leaves, grass clipping, straw, something to give me a couple of inches of organic matter on the bed and just leave it there. You can see a fork in this bed, but we're not turning it over. We're just leaving it covered for the winter until spring. And what's gonna be different if I do that? Well, first thing we'll notice is we have way less rain compaction with the mulch there because that mulch is gonna absorb the energy of the water. The mulch may compact, but the soil underneath should stay in pretty good shape. I'm still gonna have some leaching of the nutrients into the subsoil because the water is still gonna pass through. It's still gonna pick up my nitrogen and my sulfur compounds and carry them down where I don't want them. I'm still gonna have that problem. With the mulch though, I'm gonna have very few weeds. That's gonna be nice because the mulch is gonna shade out any weeds that might want to be growing in that soil. And that makes spring a little bit easier. The mulch also is gonna keep that soil cool. And that's gonna be nice because I'm not gonna have the oxidation to lose my precious organic matter. 
And the last thing that's going to happen is it's still going to be very wet in the spring. The mulch is going to trap water. There'll be no evaporating loss from the soil. It will be wet. That could be good and that could be bad. But on the other hand, it's going to be some work right now. I've got to go out there and get the mulch, find the leaves, chop them up, collect the grass from my neighbor across the street. I've got to do something right now at the end of summer to get that bed covered to last through the winter. A positive note, if I do put a mulch on it, it's going to start to break down. And right at the soil mulch level there, right at the interface, it's going to be feeding my top layer of soil. That's a good thing. I could certainly use those nutrients in my soil. And I want the earthworms and the microorganisms that are in there to be very interactive with that mulch. That would be great. It's going to make my spring planting pretty easy because all I have to do now is either rake off that mulch and expose my soil. Or if I'm that kind of gardener, I can just plant directly into the mulch, just leave it in place. I won't have the problem of breaking up compaction. I won't have the problem of pulling a bunch of weeds out. So we can make that a lot simpler. There's also going to be a lot of spring moisture. So my plants are going to get a good start without having to water too soon. That's a positive if I'm not having to turn that soil. So what's my conclusion? What do I think about just applying mulch? To me, it sounds like a good option. It sounds pretty easy. I've got some definite benefits. And seriously, if this sounds like all you need for your soil, if that's enough, sit back, apply mulch, and let it go. Gardeners have been using mulch on soil for thousands and thousands of years, and we've had some pretty good gardens without messing with cover crops. So it's okay if you stop right there and say a mulch is enough. But what if we wanted to grow a cover crop? What if we wanted even more? One of my favorites is crimson clover. It's a nitrogen fixing legume. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. On the good side, I'm going to have this little clover growing there. It's going to be maybe 12 or 18 inches tall. It's going to prevent the rain compaction because it's going to absorb the energy of that rain. That'll be a good thing. I'm going to get an improved soil structure because that red clover is going to have roots that penetrate all my soil, penetrate my clay balls. And when the clover dies, those roots break down. They leave little channels in there, which is just really super. They just make the soil delightful to work with. It's worth planting the cover crops just to get that improved soil structure. I'm going to have a lot less leaching into the subsoil because that clover is going to be doing what we call accumulating nutrients. It's going to be scrounging the nutrients out of the soil and storing them in its own leaves, on its own stems, and its flowers. So it traps the nutrients up there in the top where I need them. And that's a good thing. I'm going to get some nitrogen fixation. The clover can be a nitrogen fertilizer for me. If I was a farmer, I'd be really excited about that. Because farmers are, you know, watching that nitrogen level all the time. Nitrogen is expensive. And if they can get that nitrogen from a plant instead of having to buy it and apply it, it's all the better for them. For us in gardens, it may or may not be a benefit. Most of us tend to apply too much nitrogen as it is. There will be few weeds. The clover will smother them out. It will shade them out. They probably won't even germinate and I'll still have a relatively weed-free garden. So that's the good side. There are a lot of benefits of this. It's also going to attract pollinators. Those red clover blossoms are a bee magnet and it's fun to watch them come to your garden. That's all good. I'm going to get cool soil. Soil is going to be shaded. And now here's the interesting part. The soil is going to be drier in the spring because that clover is going to be pulling water out. It's going to be transpiring. It's going to be sucking water out of the soil. And that can be a good thing too, because if I want to work that soil, I want to turn it in any way, it'll be drier. It'll be possible to get in there sooner. That's a good thing. But here's the downside. Here's the but. This is going to be some work. I've got to get the clover seed. I've got to plant it. If it's dry, it's not dry right now, but in a normal year, it's often dry in the fall. I may have to water that clover seed. I've got to get it established and I may or may not want to do that. And here's the other complicated part you really need to think about. In the spring, I'm ready to plant my garden. I've got this big bed of clover growing there. What am I going to do with the clover to get it out of the way? Well, the term we use is to terminate it. It's a very ominous sounding term, but somehow 
I have to get rid of that clover so I can plant the stuff I want. Or possibly if it's not too tall, depending on the kind of plant I'm going to be growing, I might be able to dig holes and plant right in among the clover and let my crop grow up through the clover. That's a possibility too. And it just depends on what we're going to plant. And we'll come to that a little bit later too. I mentioned that the clover is pulling the nutrients out. It's accumulating them in its own biomass. My nitrogen is stored in the leaves of that plant. Well, they're tied up. And when I plant my plants, if I have the clover still standing there, it's going to be competition. The clover is going to be competing for the nutrients that my new crop needs. If I cut the clover off, then it's sitting there on the surface. And until it decomposes, the nutrients are tied up in those stalks. And my little plants, my new plants, may be trying to get nutrients that the clover is holding. And they won't get those nutrients until the clover turns loose. So you see, it's a little bit more complicated than it seems. The last thing here that's going to happen with the clover is if I do cut that off, then I've got this big bed, this big sea of decaying plant matter. There are plant decay organisms that are going to move in, start breaking down the clover, rotting the stem, and you know, turning it all to mush. If I'm trying to plant my new little seedlings up through this bed of decaying mush, the decay organisms may very well attack my new plants as well as the clover. So I run the risk of losing some seedlings because they're growing up in a bed of decaying matter. So it's all overcomable. We can make it all work, but it requires a little bit of forethought, a little bit of planning. So what's the conclusion about growing clover? We're going to think about that one. Well, you've heard some advantages. It's better than plain mulch for some things, but it also sounds like a lot more work and a lot more planning. And all I can say is, Maybe it's worth a try. Maybe you pick a garden bed. Maybe you give a shot. It may do some wonderful things for you. So as I've been talking here, you've heard some words like annual, nitrogen fixation, termination, decomposition. It sounds complicated right now. And part of my goal here today is try to make that simpler so you understand how that all fits together. So let's summarize here. What's our bottom line? If I just want to use mulch, it's going to protect my soil. It's going to cool my soil. I'm going to have some nutrients provided by the mulch as the organisms start to break it down at the soil level. It's going to suppress the weeds. But if I want more, I can add the cover crop. I'm going to get all those benefits of mulch. The cover crop is in effect a living mulch, but I'm also going to get an improvement in my soil filth, my soil structure. It's going to scavenge nutrients out so I don't lose them. If I'm planting clover, it may supply some extra nitrogen and it may attract pollinators if it's a blooming plant. So the cover crop can do more than just the mulch, but you have to be willing to do the work. So let's assume you are. Let's say you're still with me here. If you want to go on, you're going to say, okay, cover crops are worth a try. Well, let's grab a cup of coffee and think about just how we're going to make this work. The question you probably are asking then is, what cover crop should I be planting? There are so many possibilities. And before you try to answer that, I'm going to suggest that you ask yourself, why am I planting this? What's my purpose? And some of the purposes that we have as gardeners are different than the purposes that a farmer would have because we're on a different scale. We just have different things going on. We want to ask ourselves, what are we trying to accomplish? Why are we planting a cover crop? One of the big east, you've already heard about it, is to improve the soil. Around here, we want to break up our clay. We want to open up the pores. We want to overcome compaction. If we open the pores, rain gets in, water gets in. It's a great way to just improve the texture and quality of your soil. And that helps your plants grow long term. So that's really an important reason. We've already talked about scavenging the nutrients, holding them in the bionaphs, holding them in the plant material so they don't leach down into the subsoil where your plants can't get them. That's a good reason to plant a cover crop. You might want to have your cover crop roots reach way down into the subsoil, down 18 inches, grab the nutrients that are already down there and pull them up to where your plants can get out of them. Pulling nutrients up is an important function. Because as things leach down, they're lost to your crop. Some of the cover crops are great at going down to the subsoil, 
pulling them back up. That's really important. You may want to add nitrogen. You may want that nitrogen fixation which you get from the legumes like clover. That's worked well. And lastly, here related to that, you may want to attract pollinators. If you have a blooming plant, you can see in the picture that some of those plants are definitely blooming. There's some crimson clover in there. Looks like some sort of a pea or a radish growing in there. All of those will attract pollinators. And the last thing your cover crop might do is provide a living mulch. This is a little bit different category of thought here. But sometimes you have perennials, you have established plants, and you want to have a mulch there that stays permanently. Well, cover crop can do that. White clover is often used for that. I hope we have time to talk about that just a little bit. But that can be a definite benefit too. So the important thing is decide why you want to do this. What are you trying to accomplish? And once you know what you're trying to do, then you can stand out in the garden, scratch your head and say, okay, I know what I want to do. How do I make the cover crop do it? What is going to work? And some questions you want to ask now is just what cover crops can I plant based on this the time of the year? What are my choices? If it's winter, you're not going to plant a heat loving cover crop. So if you're just want to have a cover crop on your garden for four weeks, you're not going to plant something that takes three months to really provide any benefit. So you look at the realm of cover crops and decide which ones are possibilities. Once you know that, you ask yourself, well, when can I plant it? Can I plant it in the summer? Can I plant it now in the fall? Can I plant it in the middle of winter? When does it have to go in the ground? Once I know that, how do I plant it? How do I get it in the soil? What do I have to do to make it well established? That's not just a trivial question. That's worth thinking about. Then the big one, once I have it and it's growing off my beds, I've created a monster. How do I get rid of it? It's too big. It's covered everything up. There's no room for my plants. How am I going to terminate it? And the last important question is thinking about what you're going to plant as your next real crop, your carrots, your beans, your tomatoes. What am I going to plant after my cover crop? And will the cover crop itself have an effect on my next planting? Will it be an adverse effect? Will it be a problem transitioning from the cover crop to my next plant? So you see, it's kind of complicated. Let me give you three examples of how you might approach this to simplify it enough and to make this really manageable for you. Let's talk some specific examples. Let's say the first thing you want to do is you want to improve your soil, you want to break up your clay, you want to open things up, you want to grab those nutrients in the top, you want to pull those nutrients up from your subsoil into your top soil. You don't care about nitrogen fixation, you've got plenty of nitrogen out there or you can buy it pretty cheaply. You don't care about pollinators and you're not planting among other plants, it's not a living bulge, it's going to be a plant at once, terminate it and be done. So that's your purpose. Improve my soil and deal with my nutrients. What plant should I plant? My number one favor is the grain plant, winter rye. I have planted winter rye. I'm going to give this away. I have planted winter rye in my gardens around the country for 42 years. That's a lot of growing grain, a lot of winter rye. Some things about it. It's widely available, it's inexpensive, it grows anywhere in sun or light shade. It's just a great all around plant. Let's talk about some more advantages of it. It is the one that will improve your soil. Look at those roots the guy's holding up there. Look at how fibrous those roots are. You see how the soil at the bottom there is actually clinging to those roots. Off on the right, you can see a washed out picture and you can see how long and fibrous those roots are. They're wide. That clump of rye spins out roots wide near the top of your soil, scavenges nutrients, penetrates your clay, but they also go deep. They go down into the subsoil. They grab any nutrients that are down there and they pull them up into those green rye stems. And then as it decomposes, as all those little fine roots decompose, they leave channels in the soil. They leave little tubes in there. So water can penetrate, air can penetrate, and you get just an increase in the whole living ecosystem there where those roots exist. They're superb for tilth. I've always been amazed when I plant rye how my soil becomes very, very quickly improved. 
So we're going to plant rye. Well, it's called winter rye. When can we plant it? Winter rye is called a winter hardy annual, which means basically that you plant it in the fall, it grows or at least sits there undisturbed all winter. And then in the spring, it puts on a big bunch of growth. And as an annual, after it puts on the big bunch of growth in the spring, it dies. It's done its job and it wants to die. So the good thing about winter rye is you can plant it late. You can plant it here in the Asheville area up till Thanksgiving even. So you can wait till you've had your first frost. You pick the last peppers, you know, the green tomatoes run ripening on the windowsill. And here you are, maybe even the end of October, the first part of November, you pull things off the beds. You can still put rye in there now. It will be small all winter, but it won't care. You see picture here, rye in the snow, rye loves snow. So plant it late. It's a great crop for the very end of the year. And the odd thing on rye, even though you don't see much happening up above ground, below ground, anytime the ground isn't frozen, those rye roots are going to be growing and spreading out and doing what you want in your garden. So it's a great winter cover crop. How do I plant it? How do I actually get it out there? Well, farmers would drill it. They would make furrows and they would drill it in and get it all just exactly right. But the easiest way for us to do it is just to broadcast it like you see the gentleman there doing. Just fling it out on your soil, rake it in. You want your soil to be a little bit loose, rake it in. You're only trying to cover it maybe about a half an inch, so raking it in works really well. Back in the old days, before I became a no-chill gardener, I used to broadcast it out and then run my tiller across it, set on the shallowest setting. So I just till like the top inch of the soil and, and just mix it up. That worked great. And when it comes up, it's going to be really pretty. It's going to be short. It's going to be a little grass. It's going to have red at the bottom, green at the top. You're going to get down there, turn on your side and stare at that and be so excited when you see those little rice shoots popping up. It's just the, the coolest thing. One thing to pay attention to is the quantity. And in the references I gave you, you'll be seeing some links to things that suggest the amount to plant for rye, for winter rye. I usually plant about six ounces per hundred square feet. It's not all going to germinate, but if I rake it in, that gives me a really nice, solid stand of rye. So pay attention to the amount to plant, and each cover crop is going to be different. So now you've got it growing. Well, now it's spring. It's grown beautifully. Look at that plant. And they're in a farmer's field. And they're in front of somebody's house. You have created a monster. It's big. It may be three feet tall. It's a big, heavy stem. It's formed tillers. It's a giant clump. It's on your garden bed. It's in the way of your tomatoes. What are you going to do with it? How do you terminate this thing? Because somehow you've got to get it out of the way for new planting. But before we talk about how to terminate it, there's another question we should ask. When do I want to terminate it? Because that's really important. You want it to terminate and die and be gone. So on winter ride, what's best on most winter annuals, what's best is to mow them down, terminate them right when they're flowering. On the rye plant here, you can see the little yellow anthers hanging off there. That guy is flowering. If you terminate it now, if you cut it now, the rye will say, hey, my job was to make seeds. My job is done. I'm finished. For the most part, it won't grow back. But if you try to cut it in February before it's blown, before it's starting to flower, it will want to grow back. And we'll be fighting it all year round. So you have to wait. And for us here, that means we terminate it in early May, typically, is when you start to see these anthers form. So don't be in a hurry. Let it get big terminate it in early May. And if some regrows, you can cut it off, you can pull it, it's not a problem. So now that we've waited, it's early May, you have this giant crop of rye. What do we do? How do we terminate it? Well, one possibility, of course, I have to say, is to call in Schwarzenegger. Call in the terminator. He can handle it. And if he's maybe a little too violent for your garden, maybe your garden is a place of peace and love and he's not welcome there, we have some other options for you. Farmers who can do things on a big scale will use roller crimpers. There's a picture of a roller crimper. They roll over the rye, they bend it off, and then it just dies. I show you that because if you read some of these references, many of them are written for farmers, and you'll see that term roller crimper come up. This is not something you're going to have in your garden. So how can you do it on a garden scale? 
couple of possibilities. One is to use a trimmer, a weed trimmer, a weed whacker, like you see in the picture on the left. You just come right down to the surface level and weed it like you were weeding the grass along your fence, only it's pretty tall. And that's a challenge because as it falls, it kind of gets in your way, but it is a way to get it. The other way is to use a hedge clipper, either an electric or a manual hedge clipper. I usually use a manual hedge clipper. It just go snip, snip, snip right at the ground level, cut it in chunks and kind of lay it off to the side. It's a workout, but it works really, really well. Another way that it is often done is with a corn knife or a sickle, where you can grab a clump of the grass and bring your sickle in and give it a slice and cut it off and lay the clump aside. And that's great for small bed, but I wouldn't want to sickle up half acre or so. If you used to do that in the Middle Ages and you've gotten a little more mechanized in there. Now, there are some hardy souls out there who will use a lawnmower. The rye is so tall that trying to push a lawnmower through it seems like a horrible job. But where I have used the lawnmower is if after I've cut the rye, I've cut the stalks down, I have the stubble, maybe the stubble is four inches up. I have used the lawnmower just to cut the stubble down a little bit more, but leave the stalks aside. So I think trying to mow it, as you see here, where you're actually cutting all the rye with a lawnmower, that is an awful lot of work and it would not be my first choice. I do want to admonish you though, don't pull it up. The temptation you know, is to pull it up and get it out of the way. You want those roots in the soil. You don't want to pull it up. Cut it off somehow. And if you wait till the first part of May, it will die. And that's what you want. You want it gone so you can get on with what you want to do. So after you've terminated it, now what? You've got rye stubble. You've got the stuff sticking up to the soil where the plants were, and it can be thick clumps. On the left-hand side here, you see a picture from our learning garden out of the Master Gardener office, and you see those brown clumps of rye sticking up. That bed was planted with rye, not very heavily. If you plant at six ounces per hundred square feet, you're going to have a lot more clumps than that. So you see, it's something that may be a challenge to plant into. The other choice, instead of leaving the clumps, you can till them or dig them under. I used to do this. It was great fun to go down the row with my fork and just turn every clump over, make sure every clump got buried. Since I've become a no-till gardener, that's not an option anymore. And so I end up leaving the clumps. But one way or another, you're going to either have to address them by turning them under, tilling them under, decomposing them, or you're going to have to figure out a way to plant among them. And of course, you also have the stalks, which are not shown here. The stalks are maybe laid off to the side. You're going to have to either turn those under, which you can do, or you're going to do what I do, set them aside, plant your plants, put the stalks back on as mulch. Either way, it works perfectly well. But somehow, you've got to be able to address the picture that you see here, because this is what you're going to end up with before you're ready to plant. So, what are you going to plant into a rice that will like that? See the picture of corn and rye residue, that works. And recognize where you are. The rye's grown all winter. It's gotten big, terminated in early May. You may want to wait till late May, give it a couple of weeks for some of those roots to decompose a little bit. Say you're planting in late May, and you may have tilled it or you may be leaving the residue. Well, if you're planting in late May, you're planting a warm season crop. Tomatoes, peppers, corn, okra, squash, beans. You're not going to be planting carrots into rye because you're planting a warm season crop. So the fact that you had to wait till May to terminate kind of restricts the window of what you can plant. And that's what I mean about thinking ahead, thinking about the whole season with the rye crop. You're going to have these big clumps of residue in there and you want to plant big seeds. Tomatoes and peppers are great because they're digging anyhow. You can dig among the clumps. You can maybe pull one clump out. It's okay. But you can get in there with these bigger plants that you're already digging. So just think about the logistics. It can be a logistics problem. Some more considerations for how it's going to affect your next plant. First, rye is a great nutrient scavenger. If your soil is really fertile right now and you grow rye in there, it's going to pull up these nutrients. It's going to be in the green stalks. You cut them down. They're lying over there. Those nutrients are going to stay in those stalks until they decompose. And rye may take all season to break down. If you leave it on the surface, it's a surface mulch, it's going to take a long time. If you can dig it in, if you till it in, it's going to break down in a couple of weeks. The point is, 
that the rye is scavenging the nutrients, which is good, but they're going to hold those nutrients in the rye and release them slowly. Your plants, if they're growing early and fast, may need nutrients that the rye has tied up. So you may have to fertilize to get your plants off to a good start. And then over time, the rye releases your nutrients. So that's one consideration for rye. Rye may be what's called allelopathic. What allelopathic means is that the roots excrete materials that prevent other seeds from germinating. Well, this is great for weed control because the rye is putting out chemicals that keeps the weeds from germinating. But if you try to plant lettuce into the rye stubble immediately, the lettuce may not be germinating because the rye is not particularly picky. It doesn't care whether it's a dandelion or a lettuce. It still has the possibility of allelopathically preventing the germination. So what do we do? Well, typically we will wait three weeks after terminating. Usually after three weeks, those allelopathic chemicals in the soil have broken down and you can go ahead and plant, but it affects your planting schedule. Little seeds have more trouble than big seeds, but it's still good to wait a little while after you terminate before you plant, and that affects what you're gonna plant and when. Rye pulls water from the soil. That's a big plant and it sucks out a lot of water. And that can be a great thing. Back in the old days, when I used to run my tiller down my garden beds, I could get into a bed that was planted with rye three weeks earlier that I could get into a bed that didn't get the rye cover crawl, pulled that much water out. It made it really nice in the spring to be able to work that soil that wasn't saturated wet. But the downside, and there's always a trade-off here as you're hearing, the downside is you're pulling water out and if your plants need water and it's a really dry spring, you may have to water sooner. Not good, not bad. Just be aware, rye is going to affect your soil moisture in the spring, and that's important. And maybe a last consideration, you've got these great big green stalks. You've got them cut, maybe you've set them aside. What do you do with them? Pretty much two choices. Use them as mulch, which is really great if plants like rye mulch, or take them out and put them on your compost pile. But if you do, you move your nutrients to your compost pile, and you've got to bring it back from the compost pile to the garden, so you have some more work involved there. But you do want to think about what you're going to do with these things, because if you have a good rye crop, you are going to have a lot of green stock mulch. So rye, it's my favorite crop, but it just requires you to give some forethought, think about what's going to happen, because interesting things are going to happen. So let's take a minute here. You guys use the chat box, ask some questions. I know Barb's going to read that and send some off to me and maybe I can answer some, maybe not. Let's give it a shot. Barb, what do we have? Okay. The first question, John, is how long can you leave soil bare before it damages it? Well, it's a buildup thing. And I would say late in the summer, right now, your major concern are winter weeds and rain compaction. It rained heavily at my house last night. That bare soil I showed you in that first slide is still out there. It is more compact than it was. I'm going to be putting a crop on it. I just haven't put it in probably later next week. So it's a continuum. In the early summer, you pull the spring crops out and it's bare in the heat of the summer. That heat is really bad for bare soil. And it just immediately starts to oxidize the organic matter, kill the little microorganisms, sends the earthworms way down deep. So it's a continuum. I'd say less time, the better, but it's not a, a night and day thing. What else do we have? I think you're probably going to cover this later on. What cover crop is best for a very large raised bed keyhole garden system where the soil is about two feet deep? Interesting. I probably won't cover that exactly. Okay. But the soil is deep. So back to those questions again, why are you putting a cover crop at all? You're probably not trying to break up the soil because those soils and those kind of beds are usually friable and nice. So you're probably trying to capture nutrients because you get a lot of water flow through that kind of bed. So I would go with something either like the rye or the clover. So it's really known for scavenging nutrients, holding those nutrients there so they don't wash out would be what I would suggest. And not something that's known for improving the soil because you probably already have really good tilt in a bed like that. Okay. And what is the best cover crop for growing garlic? If you've got garlic in, and what cover crop can you put in? I'm not sure if I understand the question. Are you asking what to plant 
before you plant garlic, or are you asking what you might interplant around existing garlic? Which way do you think we should go with that? I would say, because you put garlic in in October, you probably will have already thrown a cover crop in. I'm not sure, John. Let's try this answer. If I was going to be planting garlic, and I will be actually planting some garlic, you plant it now or in October, you plant it in the fall. So you want what we call a summer annual that's going to live across the summer and want to set seed or flower and die in the fall. Crimson clover is a really good one as a summer annual. Plant it in the spring, let it grow all summer, and then when it starts to flower late in the summer, you terminate it, kill it, and then you know, wait a little bit and then plant your garlic into there. Now, if you already had an established bed and you wanted to interplant something among the garlic, that's a little bit tougher because you want something that's really short. You want it to benefit the garlic, but not compete with the garlic. And that's a tough one because you don't want it competing for sunlight. You don't want it competing for water. You don't want it competing for nutrients. I would think one of the really small clovers that at least can do some nitrogen fixation. So it's not competing with nitrogen, but the garlic's growing over winter. So it has to be a crop that grows in the winter. Garlic is a tough question. And I'm afraid I'd have to do some research on that one. Okay, good deal. Will the decomposing rye roots compete for nutrients with your garden crop? The decomposing roots will not. They will be releasing okay. nutrients. And the roots decompose pretty fast. It's the stems, the stubble that's sticking up and the big stems where most of your nutrients are tied up. And those decompose slowly. So they're not competing, they're releasing, but they're not releasing them maybe as fast as your crop would like to take them up. So that's where the nutrient competition thing can still come in. Okay. And another question is, will all cover crops pull water from the soil? So then we need to think about which ones we need to worry about water. That's a great question and it's counterintuitive. And the answer is that all cover crops pull moisture from the soil, but they also do two other things at the same time. They tend to open the soil up. They tend to open the soil pores. So if you do get a rain, you get more soaking in rather than running off. And that lets you keep more water in there. And they also shade the garden. They shade the soil, keep it cooler. And that shading is a big block to surface evapotranspiration. So that tends to keep the soil cooler and moister. Farmers say out in the wheat country who are depending on rain for their wheat crop, they find that they actually get better growth, better soil moisture, planting a cover crop as opposed to just leaving the soil bare and letting the rain fall on it. So yes, they all compete, but they also offset that by improving the structure and shading the soil. And it's a trade-off. The farmers say that improving the structure and shading wins over pulling water out. And one last one, John, and then we'll let you get back to it. In reference to the rye cover crop, can you cover the rye stubble with a heavy plastic to speed up the decomposition and transferring of nutrients back into the soil and then plant? I would say, yes, you can cover it with a heavy plastic. And if you like plastic in your garden, that might speed it up. What I often do is I will cut my rye stalks and cut my stubble really short, you know, like an inch or two from up the ground, plant my plants like tomatoes, lay my rye stalks alongside as mulch, and then I'll cover all of that with maybe a inch or two of compost on top of the rye stalks. So they're sandwiched in there, compost, rye stalks, soil. That breaks them down really quickly. And I get the advantage of staying in an organic system. So that would be one way to speed it up. Put grass clippings on, put anything you can on top of the rye stalks and speed that process up. Okay, it sounds good. Great, thank you very much, Barb. Let's look at another example here. What if I had a different purpose? What if I didn't care so much about improving my soil? My soil is already good. All I'm really concerned about is adding extra nitrogen and attracting some pollinators. You know, I'm tired of putting horse manure on my garden. I'm tired of buying 10, 10, 10. I just want to add some nitrogen naturally. And I want more bees, butterflies out there. What could I plant for that? Well, for nitrogen fixation, free fertilizer sounds good. 
we're talking legumes, clovers, vetch, plants like that. And two things have to happen for this to work. This is really important to us as cover crop planters. First, to get that free nitrogen, to get that nitrogen fixation, which is pulling the atmospheric nitrogen that we're all breathing, converting it into a form that stays in the soil that subsequent plants can use. That's your free nitrogen. We have to have rhizobium bacteria present. They have to be there around the plant. They form these little nodules you can see in that picture on the left there. That's where this nitrogen fixation happens. And they have to infect the roots, usually right at germination. You can't apply it later. It's got to be early on, right when the plants are coming up. So you either have those rhizobium present in the soil already, or you have to supply an inoculum, they call it, which is a rhizobium mix that's the right rhizobium for that particular kind of legume. Well, they tend not to persist in the soil very much. So if you're planting, say, crimson clover, if you plant it now and then you plant it again four years from now, rhizobium that are on the clover now, four years from now, have probably died off. So unless you're planting it regularly, you may not have enough in the soil. You're better off going to an inoculum. You can buy the inoculum as a powder and mix it with the seeds when you plant, or you can buy pre-inoculated seed. I usually look around and try to find pre-inoculated seed. It's coated. So the rhizobium is right on the seed where it needs to be, and it's super simple. But if you do buy the powder, you have to get the right one. The one you see on this package, the exceed package there says pea, vetch, and lentil. That won't work for clover because it requires a different strain of rhizobium. So you have to read the label and make sure you get one that's for your plant and also watch the expiration date because the packages are usually only good for about two years. You don't want old inoculum. Well, what if you already have a fair bit of nitrogen in your soil? What we have learned is if you have a lot of nitrogen, the plant usually is not going to add very much more. You can't just boost it up to a super incredible lever because the plant says, okay, guys, we have lots of nitrogen. I don't want to send any energy down to those nodules. I'm not going to waste energy on new rhizobium. I don't need you. So it puts its energy into growing its own seeds and shoots, and the rhizobium just doesn't get established or it starves out or it doesn't have the energy. So don't think of this as a way to boost your nitrogen levels, you know, clear to the sky. If there's plenty there, you won't fix much. But that's what you're trying to do if you're trying to get this extra nitrogen in there. So let's talk about the legumes. Question you might want to ask, is my legume an annual or a perennial? Well, the clovers we like, crimson clover, I think vetch is another legume that's an annual. Most of them are annual. White clover, the one you see in your lawn, the one who's pictured here, is a perennial. So it's not going to die unless you kill it. But if we are planting an annual, when's it going to die? How's it going to affect my management plan? Is it going to die in the winter, in the spring, in the fall? What's going to happen? And based on that, when do I want to plant it? Once my bed is free, do I plant it in the spring and it grows all summer? Do I plant it in the fall and it grows all winter? Some do one, some do the other. Do I have to terminate it? Is it going to die by itself? Do I have to take some steps to bring it to an early death? If it's short, can I just plant a month? If I'm planting white clover and I'm planting tomatoes, I'll just grow right above it and it won't be a problem at all. I don't have to terminate it. What if I don't terminate it? How big is it going to get? Well, if it's hairy vetch, it may get 12 feet long. That's a little bit of a challenge in your garden. All really good questions. And lastly, of course, how will it affect my next crop? Will it affect the seeds I'm going to plant after the cover crop is gone? So if we're after nitrogen fixation, we said, and we wanted pollinators. Those were our two requests. We want a blooming legume. And my very favorite is crimson clover. It is just a sweet little plant. I need to distinguish here right now. Crimson clover, the one you see on the left, is an annual. You can grow it in the summer, you can grow it in the winter, but it will die on its own after it seeds. Red clover, which actually looks pink around here, is a perennial. It doesn't die, and it is possibly going to be on the invasive list. It seeds, it spreads. I have some in my yard, and I can see it spreading in my yard. As master gardeners, we would recommend not planting red clover unless you're sure you're going to terminate it before it seeds, because it can be a problem for us. They're both uses cover crops. I'm going to stick with crimson. 
So there it is. There's the seeds. When do I plant it? Well, it's an annual. I can plant it in the mid to late summer. I want to get it in eight weeks before a hard frost so it gets established before winter. It'll survive the winter, but I want some growth there to make it easier to survive the winter. Or I can plant it in the early spring and let it grow all summer and then terminate it and plant the fall crop like the garlic we mentioned. But it is a winter annual here. It lives over the winter. It'll flower in the spring. And that's how most of us use it. So I want to terminate it at flowering. I want to use a, a mower, a weed eater, use a sharp hoe on this and cut it off right under the surface. That will kill it. But I'm probably going to have to terminate it. Probably not going to let it set seed. It depends on how soon I get into that bed. Because if I do let it set seed, then it may reseed itself later and may become kind of a weed in my garden and I don't want that. But it scavenges nutrients very, very nicely, but it breaks down quickly. Unlike rye, it goes down really fast. So some of the advantages of crimson clover, it has a good fibrous root system. It's going to improve the till. It wasn't after that. That wasn't my reason for choosing it, but it's a bonus for me. It has deep roots. It pulls up the nutrients. And I get the nitrogen fixation if I need the extra nitrogen and I have the inoculum. It's great for attracting pollinators if I let it bloom. And that has to fit my gardening schedule. You have to weigh it. It's never just black and white. And it's flexible. I can plant it in the spring, let it grow all summer. I can plant it in the late summer and let it grow over the winter. It's a great plant that way. And the challenges are you need to inoculate or a pre-inoculated seed. This one now I'm showing is the right inoculum for crimson clover, a true clover. If you let it go too long in the spring, you may reseed and have a weed problem. And it's going to break down really quickly. If you're trying to plant into that mass of decomposing foliage, once again, it may attack your new seedlings. So you may need to pull it to the side or wait a couple of weeks for it to break down. Think about your scheduling. But it's a good, versatile crop and one that you should probably try. And while we're on the subject of clovers, let me mention white clover. It's great. It's a perennial, it grows in your lawn. It often uses a living mulch among established plantings. I will be planting some next week in my blueberry beds as a permanent cover crop living mulch in among my blueberries because this stuff is shade tolerant. So my blueberries will shade it a little bit. It'll fix nitrogen. It likes wet soil. It'll take lower pH. And my blueberry beds are low pH. The clover will grow there. It also spreads by stolons right across the soil surface. It's good and it's bad. It fills in really nicely, but it also spreads where you don't want it. So it can be hard to get rid of sometimes. Barbara, do we have any quick questions right now? I think you covered it. What would be a good cover crop for early spring planting? Would that be your crimson clover? I think it would be because it's easy to terminate and you can terminate with a sharp hoe or with the rye, you really need to wait till it flowers, but it's just too big for a sharp hoe. But you can, right. cut, over it. You can cut it off right below the ground level and it's a goner, but you still get all the benefits in the roots and you have the tops to use. Okay. And uh, how about containers? P putting cover crops in containers where they grow tomatoes and lettuce and that kind of thing. Again, I guess it, the very same things apply. For lettuce, you don't want the cover crop in there with the lettuce because you're going to be competing too much. Lettuce is too short. Tomatoes, you could plant a clover in with the tomatoes and the tomato will outgrow the clover. If you stick with the crimson clover, it's going to get about a foot high, maybe at most. Tomatoes way above it. Don't plant hairy vetch because it can go 12 feet tall and totally overwhelm your tomato. But yeah, you can interplant with the tomatoes. I think it would work fine. One question is, have we ever used Austrian winter peas? Yes, Austrian winter peas are great. They're supposed to be winter annual. My experience is that they may or may not survive the winters here. Typically, you plant them in the fall. They're often interplanted. You often plant them in the fall along with rye or along with wheat. And they grow together. The peas will twine them among the rye. It's a great thing there. And again, they may survive the winter. You can eat the tendrils. It's a little spring tonic when you're out there. They're a great crop. They're just not one that I'm going to talk about today, but I have grown them and they're worth growing here. Okay. Good do, deal. Do remember to inoculate them. Right. Just like your crimson clover. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Let's keep going then. Okay. 
Let's do one more here real quick. Suppose that this cover crop, I want to improve my soil. I'm going to get my soil better. And I'm concerned about pulling nutrients from the subsoil. I'm not so concerned about the topsoil, but I want to get that stuff that's down deep, up where it belongs. And my soil is just not porous. It's, it's like planting into concrete. And I've got to get the nutrients up and I've got to break this stuff up. My favorite there is daikon radish, sometimes called driller radish, sometimes called tiller radish. The radish you find in your favorite Japanese restaurant and your sushi tray, maybe. It's edible, but the varieties we want have been selected for root growth. This is one of my beds. What on the right is with the radishes growing last year. They make a pretty decent cover. They grow pretty well. You can see at the very bottom there, one of my radishes kind of sticking out of the soil. It's about 10 inches long, just lying on the surface there, but it's growing happily. These roots get big and they're great at aerating compacted soil. In the bottom right, you see somebody's done a profile there. They've dug down. You can see how deep those roots can go. And they make these big holes. You don't pull them. But as the roots decompose, they leave that big channel. It's like doing a super aeration job on your garden bed. And they pull nutrients from way deep and store them up in the top. It's called bio drilling. It's a great way to open new beds to be with really hard soil. I love them. They're one of my three best. Works best when the soil's moist, like in the fall they're going to grow best in the fall. The soil's really dry. They can't penetrate. If it's moist, they get in there. They can go two to six feet deep. I have pulled them out of my heavy clay with 18 inch long roots. They're pretty impressive and I really like them as a crop. Seeds look like that. It's an annual. It will die in the spring. So you plant it in the summer or the early fall because you want growth before winter. It may winter kill. So you've got to get growth in the fall. If it does overwinter and you don't terminate it, it may bloom and reseed. If it does, just pull them up. They're kind of scrawny. It's okay. And if you do have any that do survive the winter and you want to terminate, just cut the tops off. You don't have to dig them up. You don't have to get carried away. But if you snip the tops off, the crown is above the ground. It's easy to come in there and chop that top off and you're good. The advantages are they're a great scavenger for nitrogen. They're a really great scavenger for going deep, deep, deep into your subsoil. When they die, the roots decompose pretty quickly. And they release the nutrients and they leave those channels, which a lot of rain can get down into. A little fertilizer can fall into. It's really impressive what kind of a hole they leave. And they're a great way to start a new bed if you don't want to dig. Put them on a new bed and let them work the soil for you. It's excellent for that. And you can eat them. Roast them. They're pretty tasty. If you like daikons. Another way to use them is to plant around existing perennial plantings. If you have a bed that's kind of open, you can plant some daikons around it and let it aerate your existing perennials without having it in there with a fork or something. It's a convenient way to do that. And lastly, it's in the group of plants that may kill nematodes. It may be a biofumigant. The roots release sulfur compounds, which can have some real benefits killing soil pathogens. Some farmers will use them for that as opposed to fungicides, as opposed to nematocytes. They can help the garden soil that way in a way that you wouldn't have expected. So what are the challenges? I have had problems with aphids. You see a picture here of aphids. I have had aphids come in and just make a mess, not every year, but the conditions are right. I've had aphid issues. They may reseed in the spring. They're easy to pull. And when you have a big stand of them and those roots are decomposing, there's a lot of sulfur in there. They can be a little bit on the ripe side, but you know, that's farming. I just want to show you a couple more slides. Talk about how you often see cover crops in combinations. We already mentioned crimson clover and rye. That's a real classic one. The rye supports the clover so it doesn't fall over and you get the benefits of both types of crops. You can get carried away. This is not mine, I'm proud to say. Hairy bitch, cereal rye, blue lupin, crimson clover, and daikon radish all in one bed. What are you trying to accomplish? And do you have enough of any one of those to meet your goals? I'm sorry. I think that is just over the top. Here's one with oats, peas, crimson clover, and turnips. So you can be creative. You can pull in the pollinators. You can get the winter growth of oats. There are a lot of choices. But again, I'd say kind of keep it simple. Here's one. I'm not sure what's in the bed. There's a grass and there's a clover. But what I want to show you is the white clover growing in the aisles. 
So it makes a living mulch out there in the aisles, which I think is a really cool idea also. What if you want to learn more? I would first send you to this book by SAR, the Sustainable Agricultural Research and Education People. It's about 220 pages. You can download it as a PDF for free. It's written for farmers. It has a very farmer-oriented outlook. But in the middle, like around page 60, there are tables that help you decide, what can I plant in my climate? What can I plant to meet a particular objective, soil building or pollination? When can I plant it? It has a column for how much to plant in terms of ounces per hundred square feet, gardener size information. So you thumb through it and you find the parts you want, but it's a superb, superb free resource. You really can't beat it. Also, I wanna call your attention to this little chart. It is in your references. I put it in your handout and I also put the link in there to your handout. So don't try to read it now, but it's from Johnny's. And it's an excellent chart showing cover crops, what they're good for, how much to plant in terms of ounces per thousand square feet. So you maybe do a little division there, but I think it's a very good resource I want you to be aware of because that's often the question, how much do I plant? And that's the best I can do for you right now in the time that's allotted to us. I'll be happy to take some questions. There's so many things we didn't talk about. It's a big, big world. I wanna remind you too on specific questions. You can always throw them to the Master Gardener helpline. They're always looking for things to talk about. And I know Barb may tell you more about that. What other good questions do we have, Barb? Well, there was a question about, does interplanting with tomatoes increase disease possibility? I guess putting tomatoes oh. in, interplanting with the cover crop. I think that's what they're looking so, at. That's an excellent question. And one I didn't have a chance to get into, and it's really complicated. Two things happen. First, if you interplant with a cover crop that has any height on it, you're going to decrease the air circulation around your tomato plants. That usually encourages fungus. You always have the problem of when you grow a cover crop that insects like them like any other plant. So you may find, for instance, that hairy vetch is an alternate host for the tomato earworm. And down in Mississippi, I think they've eradicated miles and miles and miles of this vetch because the farmers down there are afraid it's going to affect their corn crop. Studies say it doesn't make any difference. It hasn't done any good. It's taken away a lot of a good legume. But the hairy vetch could conceivably attract the same insect that is the corn earworm. And so you could end up acting as a crop to do that. But the flip side of that is equally interesting. There are some cover crops that are very good at attracting, say, a particular variety of aphid. Then you have the predators move in, the ladybugs, the lacewings move in onto the cover crop. They eat the aphids. When you terminate the cover crops or the aphids are dead, then they move up onto your good plants and eat the aphids up there. So even though the cover crop has the, the bad insect, the good insect use it as an attractant and then move to your good plants. So yes, it's something to be aware of and it can be good and it can be bad. It's one of those complicated aspects of cover crops that doesn't make it just a simple night and day thing. Very good. And one last question. I'm not sure we can answer this one, John. What's a good source for buying small quantities of cover crop seeds? I think I can tell you from my experience that if you want to buy them locally, most of the nursery centers sell them. In the past, I don't know if it's true now, I'll be specific here. I know that Reams Creek Nursery has sold them in bulk. You can buy them by the ounce and that's convenient if you just want a little bit. A really good source here that provided a lot of educational information so they get a plus in that column is So True Seeds downtown. They have a very, very, very big cover crop selection. I have also seen a fairly good selection, not as broad as so true. I've seen a fairly good selection over at this season gardening. I know that most of the garden centers have them. I haven't been to all of them yet, but I can suggest those three as places I have been. And there are more in town. Don't take that as a specific endorsement of them, just a possibility, please. Yes, I totally agree, John. I agree. Okay, well, I think this wraps it up. And I want to thank you, John, for a really informative presentation today. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today.